So our final speaker for this session is Kim Zimmerman from the USA. And Kim's going to be talking on dysphagia and dysarthria in ALS, the importance of patient and family education. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having all of us. I wanted to start out by saying that I am from Chicago, so welcome to everyone. Um, there's all sorts of wonderful things to do in Chicago besides Michigan Avenue. There's great architecture tours, there's great Segway tours through Millennium Park, so if anybody has any questions, I'm here today and tomorrow. Um, my speech is about dysphagia and dysarthria in the ALS population and really trying to uh, stress patient and family education, which I think dovetails really well with what we just finished. The objectives of the presentation to discuss the mechanisms and tools for patient and family education and informed decision making, really important informed decision making with what we just heard, stress the relevance of patient and family education regarding motor speech and swallowing mechanisms, stress the relevance of patient and family education regarding common types of dysarthria and dysphagia seen in ALS, and then stress the relevance of incorporating patients and family members in the basic management of dysarthria in ALS. So with patient education begins on day one, and we like to say every clinic visit, every time, every patient, every time. When somebody comes to the clinic, usually three month intervals, their diagnosis can change, pardon me, their speech and swallowing diagnosis can change so much in terms of the progression that every visit is like a new diagnostic session. Uh, we want to make sure the patient really understands what the role of the speech pathologist is, and even more important, our contact information. In our clinic, our patients have our telephone numbers for our office, direct line, email, so patient and family can ask questions as they need. We want to make sure the patient really understands the concept of motor speech and of swallowing. So we talk about basic anatomy and physiology. We talk about ALS impacts of motor speech and swallowing. And then we specifically talk about the ALS speech and swallowing severity score, which we use, which we use in conjunction with the patient and family to help them understand sort of the progression, where they are, what might be coming up next. And we also talk about speech and swallowing interventions. So the role of the speech pathologist when we're discussing it with the patient, we want to make sure that um, the patient understands that we're there to assess motor speech and swallowing and giving them a nice description as to why we work with both. The anatomy that you use for speak, speaking, articulating, voicing, same anatomy that you use for chewing and swallowing, protecting your airway, so speech and swallowing is kind of like a nice marriage. We like to assist the patient in maintaining their functional communication throughout the course of their disease, and we want to assist them in achieving safe, safe, and adequate nutritional intake. So in terms of educating them on motor speech, we're going to talk to them in detail about the five different subsystems of motor speech. We're going to talk about the impact that ALS will have on their motor speech. We'll talk about the results of their motor speech evaluation, their ALS speech severity score, and then dysarthria management, including compensatory, compensatory strategies and augmentative communication. So now in talking about the different subsystems of speech, we're really going to once again hammer home those five subsystems. So the first one is resonance. That's when you talk where your voice quality resonates, right? So certain sounds should resonate in the nose, others should resonate more in the oral cavity. Next, we're going to talk about respiration, being able to get good, adequate breath support for speech, not just for phonation, but for conversation. Next, we're going to talk about phonation, so that's your voice, right? That's your voice, your vocal quality, your loudness, your ability to change pitch. We're going to look at all of those things. Next, we're going to look at articulation. So we're going to look at all of the oral motor muscles. We're going to look at the strength. We're going to look at the coordination, and we're going to look at the range of movement of those structures. And then lastly, we talk about prosody. So prosody is your rate, rhythm, stress, intonation, sort of what makes my speech sound like mine and someone who's from the UK sound like theirs. And when we look at the structures here, we really want to make sure the family and the patient understand it really is a dynamic process from abdominal breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, up through the trachea, through the oral cavity. So in terms of the impact of ALS on motor speech, you can see many times hypernasality in our patients. And once again, uh, 
most of the patients will have combination of spastic components and flaccid components, and they can differ. But many times you'll hear that hypernasality, which comes from that velum, the soft palate, not elevating so well. So you'll kind of hear that hypernasal resonance where you hear it kind of come through the nose. Along with that, you can have reduced intelligibility of speech due to the insufficient nasopharyngeal valving, and so loss of airflow, and inability to generate long phrases. Next, thinking about respiration. So our patients who have compromised breathing, they have compromised support of phonation, where they're constantly gasping for breath, and this can result in effortful speech production. Next, looking at phonation, so that's your voice quality. The really typical voice quality that you hear in the ALS patients is that spastic vocal quality. Um, speech pathologists many times will refer to it as kind of that strange strangle quality where it really sounds like it's really tight, that tight hyperreduction of the vocal fold mechanism. Um, and along with that can come reduced loudness where they can't really project. And then it's also that mono pitch. Next, looking at articulation. You can have spastic qualities and you can have flaccid qualities. So when you think about those spastic qualities of the oral facial muscles, you can have significantly slowed movement, reduced range of movement, and requiring effortful and resulting in imprecise consonants. Flaccid paresis can result, once again, in a lot of difficulty moving the oral motor structures. Uh, flaccid paresis can result in tongue weakness, atrophy, and fasciculations, where the patient has a lot of difficulty articulating and then oftentimes these patients can eventually become anarthric where they can't pronounce any sounds at all. And lastly, looking at porosity, this is gonna result in significantly slowed rate, short phrases, inappropriate pauses. So in terms of scoring, we have used um, the ALS severity score created by the Hillel Group out of uh, the University of Washington. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the ALS FRS, it looks very similar. Um, this uh, ALS severity scale was actually created in 1989. Um, the score provides a rapid and accurate assessment of the patient's disease status. Uh, the number descriptions go from 1 to 10 across five different stages, which replaces that traditional mild, moderate, severe, or profound descriptors, which many times loses um, its accuracy in terms of um, interreliability with clinicians. It assists in treatment planning in terms of using this tool, showing it to the family to help them understand what might be, might be coming next, and it allows for patient and family feedback. So looking at the ALS severity scale, this is the one for speech, going down from normal speech processes, normal versus nominal abnormalities, detectable speech disturbances, perceived speech changes, and obvious speech abnormalities, intelligible with repeating, repeating the message on occasion, frequent repeating required, speech combined with nonverbal communication, speech plus nonverbal, and then limiting your speech to one word responses, and all the way down to loss of useful speech. So vocalizing for emotional expression versus completely nonvocal. With management of dysarthria, we really wanna focus on maximizing the efficiency and the effectiveness of the patient's communication, working with them regarding compensatory strategies, and educating them about intervention, that we really want to intervene early, that we want the intervention to coincide with the decline in function, and that we also want it to be anticipatory, where we kind of know where we're going and we know which direction is coming next. For speech compensations, we're gonna work on maximizing intelligibility, basic things you would work on, and if you think about it, it all makes sense. You want their speech rate to be matched to their respiratory support. You want their speech rate to be matched to their articulatory speed, and we really want to help them utilize exaggerated articulation to exaggerate the sounds as best as possible. And next, we want to help them understand the concept of conservation of energy, and not just the conservation of energy that you might think of where if your speech fatigues, take a rest in the afternoon, not just that kind, but also conservation in terms of making sure that people understand the context of what you're saying before you move on to the next topic helping the patient and family utilize gestures to assist in communication, stressing the importance of eye contact, particularly with family members. We don't realize how much of our communication and interaction is based on watching somebody talk, which is why the majority of our ALS patients come in and their speech sounds a little slurred, but they'll say, my friends can't understand me at all when I'm on the phone. 
because speech sounds are distorted on the phone anyway. Uh, lastly, we talked to them about uh, using alphabet boards for initial letter clarification. Augmentative communication. Now, with all of the presentations this morning or today, uh, it's obvious that this is a huge area that I can't go into every amount of detail on, but we want the patients to understand and the families to understand what augmentative communication is and what they're entitled to with regards to their insurance. Um, we want them to know that if, and it's always if, if their speech changes so significantly that they need to rely on augmentative communication system as a primary mean to supplement their speech, that we're there for them, that we can help them understand what, what they can use. Uh, we go from the very basics, written communication, to low-tech techniques like the eye gaze letter boards to the full-blown multi-purpose systems um, from Dynavox and Toby as well as patients who come in with their iPads or their iPhones or Kindles. And we also talk about different access methods, right, D direct selection, eye gaze, switches, mouses, etc. Next, talking about educating the patient about swallowing. So we want them to understand the phases of swallowing, we want them to understand the impact that ALS has on swallowing. We want them to understand the evaluation of swallowing as well as the swallowing score. We want them to understand dysphagia management and the types of recommendations we would make. And we also want to bring up the conversation about G-tube placement. So in terms of talking about oral phase of swallowing, this is probably a nice review for everybody here too. So talking about the oral phase of swallowing, we're really talking about bolus acceptance, manipulation, propulsion, right? And thinking about all of those structures that are involved, the lips, the cheeks, the tongue, the jaw. Next, thinking about the pharyngeal phase of the swallow, and one thing I really try and help the families remember is the pharyngeal phase of the swallow happens really quick. You have a lot of things that need to happen very dynamically at the same time, right? So you think about it, initiation of the swallow, tongue pushes back, you have three levels of airway closure, you have the muscles in the pharynx that are circular, they squeeze to push the food down, the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, it tightens back up again, and then you resume breathing. So any little glitch can cause a significant problem. So once again, reviewing the structures that are involved, soft palate, nasal, oral, hypopharynx, larynx, and the upper esophageal sphincter. Oh. Okay, so now this is a video of a normal swallow. And I'm going to let it play. It's going to kind of circle through a couple of times. So as you're looking at it, you want to see how they take it, the food into the mouth. We're going to look here, looking for velum elevation. You see the velum elevate. You see the hyoid bone here as the, as the swallow triggers, the hyoid bone elevates and moves anteriorly. You're going to look at the epiglottis here. As the swallow triggers, the epiglottis descends, pops back up, nice, smooth, coordinated. So in terms of scoring dysphagia, we're going to use the same tool that we use for speech, but this time it addresses swallowing. So the severity scale for swallowing, Normal eating habits, including normal swallowing and nominal swallowing abnormalities. Early eating problems, minor swallowing to prolonged time to manipulate or smaller bites or sips. Dietary consistency changes, moving to a soft diet versus a liquefied or a pureed diet. Uh, pushing towards needing tube feeding, supplemental tube feeding versus tube feeding with occasional oral nutrition, and then moving towards no oral feeding at all, looking at secretions, patients who have their secretions managed with an aspirator or a medication, all the way to aspiration of those secretions. So the impact of ALS on swallowing, we talked about what happens with those structures, and when you really think about the tongue and our patients who have weakness in the tongue, the patients who have weakness in the tongue are going to have a hard time controlling what's in the mouth. You can have loss of force for mastication, bolus transport, manipulation, loss of valving, delayed initiation of the swallow response. So here we have a swallowing that's abnormal. You can see there's already solid food that's stuck in the throat here, and there was aspiration of liquid during the swallow. We're going to see that a couple more times. So stasis getting stuck, swallowing, entering the airway, yeah. 
when we talk about management of dysphagia in ALS, uh, you know, there's no strong evidence that swallow exercises will maintain or improve the swallow function. We make sure the families do understand that. However, we like to stress to them, we want you to use what you have. Best exercise for speaking and swallowing, talking, managing your secretions, or eating. Um, we want to push considering doing a video swallow study if necessary when a patient reaches around a level six or when they have dietary changes. We talk about compensatory swallow strategies as well as diet modification. And then a PEG tube. We introduced the concept early, particularly with our bulbar onset patients. Our physicians like to have a PEG tube placed before the vital cap capacity plummets below 50 to 25%. Um, obviously the purpose we talked about in earlier presentations. Um, additional PEG considerations, relieving emerging stressors, diet modification, limiting food choices, and dehydration, all those very important. So quickly, I'm going to kind of wrap up with a case study that we have. Um, a patient that we had seen, 64-year-old woman who came in, she was employed as a receptionist. Her son and her daughter-in-law were her primary family support. Uh, she reported a six-month history of speech changes. Uh, during the course of her medical workup, she had a video swallow study at an outside hospital that showed mild aspiration of thin liquid. However, she was uh, managing it with small bites and sips. Her oral motor assessment showed hypernasality, strain strangled vocal quality, lingual fasciculations, facial weakness, and slowed speech. So in talking with her, she agreed with us. She was right around a six where she was intelligible with repeating. Um, she wanted particularly to work on techniques to improve her speech using exaggerated articulation, matching her respiration and articulation to her speech rate. And we did discuss augmentative communication, but at the time she was not interested. Her swallow evaluation for the most part was within functional limits as long as she was taking small bites and sips. And once again, we agreed on her score of a seven where it was taking her a little longer to manipulate the food and taking smaller bites. Um, with regards to her dysphagia, we continued with the strategy she was already using and we just made a note that we had had the G-tube discussion with her and we noted her weight and her BMI. Um, so her assessment, moderate mixed dysarthria, flaccid and spastic characteristics, mild to moderate oral pharyngeal dysphagia, uh, ALS speech score, six, swallow score, seven. Three-month follow-up, slight change in her motor speech score. She got a script for an augmentative communication device and did follow through and chose a Dynavox VMAX. And her swallowing hadn't changed very much and she actually had gained a pound. Four months later, uh, we noticed that her motor speech score had dropped one point, swallowing remained the same. Um, however, her weight started to drop a little bit. Uh, we did discuss the G-tube, it was revisited and she declined. Um, five months later, motor speech score was about the same. She was using her augmentative communication device for 75% of her communication um, and she left her job that January. Uh, her swallowing remained about the same. However, we did notice a change in her weight, which was a 10% change in her weight. We once again discussed the G-tube and it was placed in April. Uh, six month later follow-up, significant change again in her motor speech, vocalizing only for communication, using her augmentative communication device for 100% of her communication. Swallowing significantly changed also, dropped five points, uh, also had weight loss, moved to the point where she wasn't taking anything by mouth and her secretions were managed with the aspirator. She was only taking G-tube feeding and then um, she passed away in February. So in conclusion, we just really like to stress what it is that we're using, uh, using tools to really educate the patient and family so they can make informed decisions. That's really what we want to help people kind of move forward. Uh, the tools for patient and family education, we've chosen to use the ALS speech and swallowing severity score to educate the patients. We've used our clinic visits as re-diagnostic. Uh, we've utilized clinician accessibility and video fluoroscopic swallow studies as necessary. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Okay, we've time for two or three questions. So please again indicate by raising your hand. Anywhere? Okay, over the far side. Hi, I'm Lynn from Alabama. Um, I do have a question. Some of our patients will come to us and they, um, their therapists are using electric stim uh, and uh, other ones are the other direction. Seems like they're two different schools of thought there. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that it does any good at all? 
At University of Illinois, which is where I practice, um, we do not utilize e-STEM or vital STEM in any capacity whatsoever. Um, you know, research that uh, vital STEM has put out has shown improvements in swallowing in patients with unilateral strokes and seeing swallow improvement in the three to six month time period, which is the normal time period that people have spontaneous recovery. So I, I, don't, I don't push e-STEM at all. The final question anyway? Okay, one in the middle. Hi, Sherry, a nurse from the Les Turner ALS Foundation Hi. in Chicago. Um, when you spoke about energy conservation yes. in patients, I know that's really important to those that have any kind of respiratory compromise. And I just wanted to add that one thing we find that can be helpful is the recommendation for a voice amplifier um, that patients can wear when they're on the phone in particular where it's harder for, to be heard. And if they're in a conversation in a room with several people, they don't have to project as hard, and it's just, it saves them a lot of energy. Thank you. If I can add one more thing, I'd really like to thank my colleague, Caroline Deeskin. I didn't do that at the beginning. I don't want to be like a bad Oscar winner who forgets to thank their husband. I want to thank my colleague, Caroline Deeskin, um, our entire ALS clinic, and Drs. Julie Rowan and Matt Mergioli. Thank you. Please thank you. join me in thanking Kim.